Hello, welcome again to this session where we're going to talk about uh, shelters archaeology. I'm very happy they have invited me. My name is Silvia Marimon, journalist. I work at the ARA newspaper. I think it's fascinating to talk about what's uh, hidden underground. I think it's something fascinating. And it would be particularly interesting to talk about how we make this heritage visible, how to um, make this heritage part of citizens' memory. 1,322 shelters. I think Anna has found out some more that can tell about resistance, solidarity, and living under the bombs. Building all these shelters in a city that had no resources with um, nearly a million refugees um, and uh, in a city that did not know the ammunition used by the enemy. That's something extraordinary. And the city council has worked a lot on the topic, and it has set up a website, Ciutat Refugi, where we have all the information about what has been discovered, found out until now. And at the end of the month, an exhibition is going to open up. And it's very interesting to know would these shelters tell us how they were built? They were built with shoes, with uh, ammunition, with bottles, with uh, drugs, everything we have found. For instance, it was forbidden to talk about politics and religion in the shelters. And I think it will be interesting also to talk about what we do with the objects that have been found in shelters, because sometimes objects found by archaeology contradicts the official narrative, gives us um, give us uh, information through a sole of a shoe, a button. We can uh, imagine our own narrative the story of, that happened in the shelter, how we share all that with the citizens, how to make it available for a maximum of people, how we preserve it, what are the policies implemented in Spain, in Catalonia, in the UK, what new technologies can bring uh, for us. If the shelters are not accessible, how we make them accessible through new technologies. Um, could we give these shelters a second life? And what, uh, what kind of uh, use have these shelters have after the work? We have Gabriel Moschenka, professor of public archaeology at the University College of London. He's been working in the archaeology of conflict in the past 20 years. He has been digging in Cologne, Spain, Finland, Kenya, and the UK. He has uh, participated in the digging of anti-craft shelters, and he has been publishing uh, books, uh, one in which he published the study he has done in shelters uh, that were in schools. We have Jordi Ramos as well, archaeologist. Uh, he has a degree uh, from the University of Barcelona. He has been studying Barcelona shelters, the ones built during the Civil War and during Franco's time. He knows very well the active and passive defense that uh, was organized, and he's an expert in mass uh, graves. He is in Mallorca. And not that long ago, the special rapporteur of the United Nations visited Mallorca to see the work being done with mass graves. And he's uh, studying the PhD in uh, Barcelona, directed by Coral Sule. We have Miquel Mezquida, an archaeologist and director of the Scientific Association Archaeoantrio. He has participated in digging the identification of victims of the Spanish Civil War since 2008. And he has participated in the creation of a map of uh, the um, shelters in Valencia, also in Madrid and Murcia. And he has directed the digging of uh, many uh, mass graves, particularly in Valencia, in Paterna, where 176 bodies have been recovered. He has uh, studied also 
trenches, uh, amongst others, in the city of Valencia. Xavier Maese, he has a degree in history by the University of Barcelona. He is an archaeologist as well. He has been working in numerous archaeological sites. He has worked for the Catalan government, the Andorran government, and he is an archaeologist working for the Barcelona City Council. And Montserrat Pujes, he has an art degree of Barcelona. She has been a university professor and she has participated in the restoration of several materials from different times. She founded Grapat, a research group multidisciplinary that belongs to the Autonomous University of Barcelona and the Rubira Ibrigili. She has participated in several national and international fora. I would like to start with Gabriel Moshenka. I've seen his website and I like a sentence I found which says that as an archaeologist, a public archaeologist, his moral and ethical obligation is to convey the knowledge to a maximum of people. And I wonder how they do that from London, how the information and the findings have been made accessible for a maximum of population. And because you you're a specialist in shelters in uh, British schools. Would children tell us about their experience in those shelters? Is it on now? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. OK. Thank you. It's a, a, a great pleasure to be here amongst colleagues who share my fascination with the heritage of civil defense and the history of bombing. From the, from the perspective of those who are bombed. Um, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me, uh, me here to take part. Um, I must ap apologize for speaking only in English. I am the, the product of a typical British education. Um, I've been working, st studying, surveying, and excavating air raid shelters for almost 20 years now. Um, this has included field work as part of my doctorate in the archaeology and memory of the Second World War in London. Um, I've explored concrete mm, megastructures, medieval church crypts used as shelters, prehistoric caves used as shelters, and uh, shallow trenches dug in forests. Every kind of shelter you can imagine. Um, often when, when I'm asked as an archaeologist to advise or uh, consult to consult on air raid shelter heritage, it is because they are about to be destroyed. Um, this, is, this is a depressing but routine aspect of archaeological heritage management. Um, in the course of my work, I've identified several themes in the archaeology and heritage of air raid shelters. These include abundance. Shelters have been constructed in their tens of Millions. Oh, what, what have I done here? No, this is not affecting us. No. No, nope, that's no. fine. I know. Um, yeah, sh there are tens of millions of sh shelters constructed in the last century and more, and more are being built all the time as well. Second theme is variety. Shelters vary, as I've said, enormously in scale, material, and their relation to pre existing st st structures. Another theme is erasure. A few sh shelters have afterlives, as we've seen, as museums and monuments, but the vast majority are destroyed or allowed to um, decay. On the other hand, another theme is endurance. Dis uh, despite this widespread lack of interest, many shelters have survived and some will likely continue to survive in good condition, the Berlin bunker we saw this morning is probably indestructible. Finally, ambiguity. Between erasure and endurance, there is the um, ambiguous heritage of air age shelters. Shelters built, buried, and f uh, f forgotten. The entrances and the exits lost um, at least for now. Some of these themes have already been touched on in this, in this 
conference. I, I believe that, th that they can help to structure and organize a, f a future international collaborative study of air age uh, shelter heritage. I'll t t touch on them more in a moment. The, 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 the main focus of my talk, and I will be quick because time is short, is to raise what I think are three significant challenges in the preservation and management of air age shelter heritage. These are also challenges that face researchers that, um, trying to study this, this heritage as well. The first is a general lack of heritage protection, heritage guidance, and academic and professional research. I am speaking mainly from a British perspective, but from a general, uh, with a global overview as well. The second theme draws on the those that I identified above, the perceived abundance and resilience of, of air age shelter heritage. There are m millions of them, according to, uh, to this critique, and they are generally indestructible. Well, yes and no. Third and finally, the problem of invisibility. The, literally, in that many shelters are hidden underground while others are hidden in plain our sight, and, and yet others are misidentified. So I will speak briefly to these three challenges. On the first point, the lack of protection, lack of research, lack of official interest. In his study of air raid shelter policies, the architectural historian Ocas Bosma asked, what standpoint should we adopt towards the eroding remains of military and civilian bomb shelters. How can we establish their significance for the present? In the past 25 years, there's been a growth in archeology span and heritage management work focused on the violent conflicts of the 20th century. However, the heritage professional consensus around air raid shelters remains, we don't know, it doesn't really matter. It is described as a good subject for amateur historians and for archaeology st um, students. This is heritage speak for we don't care. This is, this is reflected in research agenda documents, in overviews of the discipline, and in reports by professionals who really should know better. In, 20, in 2016, um, Historic England, the National Heritage Preservation Organization published a small pamphlet sh um, shown here called Civil Defense from the First World War to the Cold War. This small document attempts to cover a, a, a great deal of heritage uh, of sites, including all the major categories of UK civil defense structures. This is a good document, but it is very basic. It, does not reflect a change in the heritage protection offered to air raid sh shelters, nor is there much guidance for excavation, survey, recording, or for historical research as well. On my second point, abundance. Heritage, uh, a, a, a value, like many forms of value, is in part a reflection of rarity and vulnerability. Air raid shelters are not at risk of extinction like tigers. Some of them built within living memory will probably last longer than the pyramids of Egypt. In Britain, the number of air raid shelters built during the Second World War in homes, gardens, parks, streets, schools, and workplaces number in the millions, probably between five and 10 million were constructed. Throughout the Cold War, many, uh, 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 many nations in Europe and elsewhere had laws that required the construction of nuclear uh, shelters in all new homes. Uh, Sweden, Finland, Switzerland, and elsewhere enjoy a rich abundance of air age shelters. Um, I would argue that there is a value in abundance as well as in rarity. The vast number of air raid shelters is reflected in their cultural impact in literature, art, um, on the heritage of 
everyday life and on vernacular architecture. They are lived, a living heritage. Finally, the problem of invisibility. In a school in North London, I conducted a geophysical survey that found eight air raid shelters underneath the uh, uh, football field, each for 50 people. Nobody in the school had any idea of their ex existence. They believed there was maybe one or two somewhere in the school. In just uh, uh, 60 years, they had disappeared from memory Oh, completely, they were invisible. In Barcelona, as we know, there are unknown hundreds of, of air raid shelters below the uh, city, or rather, we know they are unknown. Um, in London, I have uh, surveyed the locations of a project to build huge underground air raid shelters, pictured here. Each one would hold 12,000 people. This project began in 1938, was cancelled. The shelters were never, in fact, built. But standing on the grass, standing where on the ground above where they would have, have been created, this absence feels ambiguous. On the surface, they might be there, they might not be there. An archaeological survey of air raid shelters in Australia found that a folklore and folk memory can create inaccurate and imaginative stories of underground spaces that never existed. What exists is more banal than the imagination. Buried heritage can be resistant to study as well. I'm currently studying our shelters in a park in London that have so far resisted all forms of, of geophysics that I've been able to conduct. But from aerial photographs and from parch marks in the grass, I know they're there, but, it, but for now that they are hiding from me in the horrible, sticky London clay. I will find them eventually. I know they're there. There are other forms of invisibility, of course. I have seen air raid shelter, air raid protection uh, uh, trenches in military our camps misidentified as our training our trenches. I've seen our domestic air raid shelters mistaken for our fish ponds. So widespread public ignorance of air raid shelter heritage is a, a problem for their preservation as well. Despite these three uh, uh, challenges or l limiting uh, factors, I see a great deal of exciting potential in the future studies of air raid of shelters. There are three themes I'd like to see shape this future research. These are firstly a hot interpretation. I believe there is a place for emotion in heritage interpretation, and we've seen some examples of that this morning. In the history of air warfare, this is particularly re relevant. This, our scientist, JBS Haldane, who visited Spain during the uh, Civil War from England, wrote a, a book on air raid protection for British readers. And he wrote, and it says here, I hate having to write this book. Air raids are not only wrong, they are loathsome and disgusting. If you'd ever seen a child smashed by a, a, a bomb into something like a mixture of dirty rags and of cat's meat, you would realize this fact as intensely as I do. Some of this anger and disgust should find a place within the study and management of heritage as well. The theme of absence, which I presented above as a, a challenge, is also an opportunity. Absences are spaces for imagination, for speculation, for philosophy and art and architecture and ghost stories. Absences are generative and we can work with them. The final and most vital theme in the study of air raid shelters is internationalism. Firstly, on a practical level, these are international heritage. We know that the, the Catalan experience of air raids influenced British civil defense policy through the engineer Ramon Pereira, for example. But 
drawing again on this idea of emotion in heritage. I think there, there, there is an internationalism of air raid shelters that connects the experience of terrified children and their parents um, right now in Kiev, in Gaza, Syria, uh, Yemen, and in the past in Barcelona, Tokyo, Hamburg, elsewhere. To find the universal in these experiences is to break down divisions between people and to focus again on the shared human tragedies, finding human solidarity in histories of violence. So that is m m m my hope for the future of this work. Muchas gracias. <clears throat>
how the procedure in these uh, shelters, particularly in 1935, all this information got to Spain and guided how the Spanish shelter would be. The first time uh, we hear about passive defense, it was in 1935 the de and a decree. And Catalonia also had some law um, during the war. It is a new organization or people, uh, things were organized differently. And here we talk about the passive defense. And this morning we were saying whether it's passive defense or civil defense. Here um, in Spain, passive defense, it's something that's in, in the law since 1935. And in 1941, it's called passive defense. In the 1960, it's called civil defense. So here, passive. Before we talk uh, passive defense, then civil protection, and the Spanish Constitution. And in 1985, passive defense became civil protection, and it's what we have now. The passive defense that was approved took place when uh, Franco was in power. He was, uh, it was the commander of the Ministry of War, and I'm saying that because Oftentimes, we think that passive de defense is something linked to the republic. No, both parties had passive defense. And I'm going to give you some examples later. And this law establishes that uh, local committees, and in 1935, and during the Civil War, and in Barcelona, this local committee were organized. But this is regulated by the law. So what happened is that we inherited this passive defense. Uh, Catalonia um, implemented it in a way, Madrid in another, and populations with over 8,000 inhabitants organized in this way. There was a mayor president, a military delegate, delegate uh, doctors, pharmacists. There are different aspects of the organization that were features of this passive defense. And then there, were, there was a training of a specialist that uh, was uh, done during the war to prepare the possible passive defense. It's not just a raid shelter. Passive defense is many things. Passive defense, if we introduce anti-aircraft defense or anti-air raid defense, defense against aircraft is a royal wither of January 15, 1931. So the Spanish state already with a group of anti-aircraft artillery, they tried to have a potential defense against aircraft and introduce it in the legislation. The defense against aircraft in 1931 is organized around a central unit, mainly Madrid and Zaragoza. And when the war started, an artillery group remain on one side and the other one in the other. But active defense goes beyond that. We're talking about artillery, anti-aircraft, and these devices to detect attacks based on sound patterns. And in passive defense, we have shelters, but beyond that, of course, shelters are the, the main weight 
of passive defense, but also displacing the population to different areas. This is an act of passive defense and also obscuring, which means controlling electricity and in the case of bombings, leaving all of the population in the dark. This is a mechanism that the Franco regime also used later on and also including sirens and the firefighters. This would all be included in passive defense. And the information service is the information service uh, that controls aircrafts, the coming of aircrafts. In the area of the Mediterranean, they used ships in the Mediterranean to detect uh, ships, uh, incoming ships or aircrafts, any potential enemy. And then they communicated this information to the central. These are watch towers or, or vigilance uh, centers, checkpoints that worked all over the state. The information service is also a meteorology service. It was almost unheard of back in the day because they studied the weather conditions so that in the event of weather changes, rainfall, if the sun shined, uh, depending on the time of year, they, they calculated potential attacks based on that. And anti-aircraft defense, this is something that started in 1931. This was organized by the Republic and during the Civil War, this was a defense mechanism that they perfected, both Republicans and the Franco regime. And this classification is something that I continue to shift over time. But my intention years ago was to try and classify different types of shelters in the state. There are many different types of shelters. There were many different types during the Civil War. Almost every city had its own type of shelter, but the intention was to classify them. It is just a proposal that I've been perfecting over time, but it is an overview of this air raid shelters during the war and part of the Franco regime. Earlier, I said, and Gerard Maria Contel said earlier, that bombs know no sites. And I will show you some pictures beyond explaining what these shelters are. I just wanted to give you an assessment and, and to generate some debate. These are shelters from the Palma de Mallorca island, the city of Palma de Mallorca. And in July 1936, they received successive and frequent bombings. And the population of Palma tried to protect itself from these bombings. And the architects and engineers of the island were the ones who, for two years, participated in the building of these air raid shelters. After the civil war, they became obsolete. And I'm showing them here for a reason, because these are shelters built by the rebel army, by the rebel side. Bartomeu Field wrote a book. He did a huge task of analyzing all of these shelters. He's a researcher, he's no archaeologist, and he has listed all of these shelters. And they have a program now, a memory policy program of the Balearic Island government, who've been working intensely on research beyond the island of Palma. Because during the civil war, the entire island worked on creating these shelters, but they belong to the rebel uh, site. And most of them are quite similar. They are built of concrete. And they're similar to the Republican shelters and the Spanish phalange. I don't know if you can see the black book, but they also published a booklet 
explaining these uh, how to how these air raid shelters were to be and i'm showing this because what well, we're thinking about they're thinking about what to do with this heritage in majorca they think there that they need to be opened up to the public and explained and it's just one more piece of what happened in the island the republican bombings in the island and the comparison with the bombings by the italians and the condor legion well the the, the intensity of the of the bombings was much higher than that of the Republican bombings. And another example is Maon. Um, for a short time now, they've been working and doing research at different groups, different organizations to support the memory of Menorca. Different engineers, researchers are developing a very significant task, mainly for the Council of Menorca. And now they have commissioned a study on these uh, shelters. But Menorca was Republican, was on the Republican side. And the difference between islands is quite obvious. These are tunnels created by people linked to the mining profession. And I think Xavier also said before that there were people who slept here in these shelters. There weren't many bombings in Menorca, and it is true that many people lived in these shelters. And what we are seeing through archaeology and the study of these tunnels, these under tunnels mainly in Maon, is showing these these memories. Is talking about these memories. P children went down to play in these shelters, so we are we're trying to recover these these memories. And another case is the Santander shelters, 114 shelters in the city of Santander. There is a very relevant one which has become a museum, the one you can see in the picture, Mariana Pineda, which was built for three months. It was a, a quick operation. It was made of concrete. A team of architects participated. And I'm showing this precisely because I don't know if you know it, if you know this shelter, but they were very quick uh, building it during a bombing in the city. They, they built it. And subsequently, it was abandoned. And in 1941, there was a fire in the city, and they forgot about it. And in 2006, they recovered it, and they turned it into a museum. And I don't know if you know this, but they have a permanent exhibit. There are two plaques of two dead pilots of the Condor Legion who died in Santander. There is a 250-kilo bomb, a German bomb, which was given by the Aeronautical Museum in Spain. And they play around with this symbiosis. They have pictures, for example, of furniture, toys, and amongst this military environment. And I'm, I'm showing this here to talk about how in different areas of the country they use these shelters differently. Another shelter, uh, another place where there were many shelters was Madrid. Uh, it was the front line. Madrid was the front line for around 29 months. The bombings were mainly in November 1936. And since April 1937, they devised a plan to build a raid shelters in the capital city. And they started building lots of shelters, but the concept in Madrid, and I wanted to propose this mainly for the debate, Madrid cannot operate only with air raid shelters. It doesn't work because it's the front line. And because civil shelters coexist with military shelters, and there are different military settlements, different machine gun nests and bunkers, and they work as a unit. And of course, it is the capital of the state, and it operates with active and passive defense jointly. The population of Madrid was in different neighborhoods. There were 
civil shelters, but also military shelters and bunkers to face the different attacks. And another example of these types of shelters, and talking about signposting and graffiti in the shelters, I think archaeology is a discipline that should identify these graffiti and these different types of shelters. But everything should work as a whole. Memory, history, archaeology should go hand in hand in the identification of these shelters. The shelter in Wadix. Wadix is in Granada, and it is a very important communication hub in the southeast of the peninsula. And the shelters there were studied many years ago. They, thanks to the will of the civil society, some more shelters have been opened up, and they show them from a very educational perspective. The big attraction of Wadix is the cathedral and the air raid shelter. Just to give you an example of this type. And then in the one at Villanueva de Córdoba, this one was built in the first few months of 1938. And it comes from a commission by Aldo Morandi, a high, an Italian high commander who created a program of air shelters, mainly as a space to shelter 32,000 people from a town which at the time had 16,000 inhabitants. And what conflict do I see personally in this type of shelter, like the one in Villanueva de Córdoba? It had a population of 16,000 inhabitants, but the program was for 32,000 people. It was supposed to hold 32,000 people because of the because all of the refugees from the Andalusian fields would, were to use these shelters. And after the civil war, they found many shelters in Villanova de Córdoba, a town which at the moment has around 8,000 inhabitants. But in order to understand this, we need to understand the concept of uh, the, the refugees who took shelter in these shelters. There was also an average shelter in Jaén, which was bombed by the Condor Legion in 1937 with 159 victims of this bombing, most of them children. If I remember correctly, it was a Thursday afternoon, and many children were playing out on the streets. And this was April 1st, and on April 2nd, the Republican Town Council, and this is quite famous in the city of Jaén, Javier Campos of the Republican site back then, ordered that almost all of the almost all the the entire population were to start building these shelters and then in a very short period of time they started building these these shelters and in Almeria Almeria is very important in order to understand these shelters and the people who took shelter there and finally, just to mention graffiti and what to do with material culture. This was the military position of Cipiano Mera, a shelter that caused many legal problems because it's, it's a bit far from the city center. People have stolen materials and materials are now dispersed and they've closed it on occasion, and I'm showing it mainly because I wanted to talk about what to do with these materials and what to, to have a debate with you about that. Thank you very much, Jordi. We've been talking about invisibility, how to integrate the oral narrative into the story of these shelters. Jordi has been telling us about several shelters in Spain, and Miquel Mesquida will tell us about Valencia. What has been done in Valencia to get back these shelters and what heritage value is 
being given to these shelters and how make the story of the shelters public. First of all, I would like to thank the Barcelona City Council and the organizers for having invited me. Twenty years ago, I came here only to be beaten in uh, rugby games here in La Fosharda, but now uh, I'm going to tell you about what we are trying to do in the Valencia region concerning shelters. Historical context, maybe I don't need to tell you a lot about it. After the coup d'etat, we know that in the area of Valencia that become an important asset to bomb, to terrorize population, we know that Mallorca, from Mallorca the, the aircraft departed to bomb uh, Cartagena, Almeria, and all this coastal line. The bombings start in October 36, Cartagena, Barcelona, November 36, Almeria, Gen January 37, Valencia, January 37, and it's a machinery that goes on and on till the end of the war. And Valencia is a clear example. Shatiba suffer a very a terrible attack in 1937, 39, sorry. And we can have data. It has already been mentioned that um, building shelters was something important, and many people died despite all these shelters along the coastline and we're working on that. Only in Valencia, in the city of Valencia, and I th we think that we might have 350 uh, shelters. We think that more than, here it's written 300, we think more than 300. 637 days of bombing of a different ports in the Valencia region and over 1,800 victims. Uh, we have identified and known identified 500 uh, dead people in Valencia after 150 days of bombing. Several bombings, sometimes uh, per day, and uh, Alicante as well. 490 victims. I will try to tell you what's been done in the Valencia region. Here you have the bibliography. We have the main specialist. Pepe has a couple of uh, posters that he's presented. Uh, I would like to talk about the legal framework that we have in the Valencia region. Uh, at the national level, we have laws concerning heritage and democratic memory. But it's true that in the Valencia region we have this double protection because the law on heritage included remnants from uh, the war and the city councils now are um, taking on or are, are registering all these objects and some uh, city councils were already working on this uh, register uh, that includes the um, heritage from the Civil War. So from 2017, uh, with a law on memory that protects uh, the memorial places, but also the remnants uh, from the war. And as I was telling you, uh, Valencia includes or included already eight shelters in 2015. The Valencia region, until eight years ago, 
everything related to archaeology uh, from civil war was forbidden because of political reasons in that region. And talking about civil war was something completely forgotten. And people uh, working on this topic had to work in Aragon or in other places where the law on uh, memory um, had already been implemented and until 20 but until 2015 in the Valencia region there was no work done on civil war heritage and showing it to the public practical cases or examples in the last eight years, we have been working on shelters in the main villages and towns in Castellón, Valencia, Alicante. Here we have examples, uh, Castellón, Tetuana um, Square in Valencia. We have several shelters in schools and uh, sometimes the teachers in those higher schools have uh, worked on them and had uh, created some visits and th thanks to the resources given by the department by the department of transparency and uh, democratic culture several uh, shelters um, there are studies about several shelters in different places in the region if we talk about Valencia City, there are three shelters that can be visited. And there is in one a permanent ex exhibition explaining the situation. Then uh, we can visit that um, shelter. It's located in a place that uh, used to be the headquarters of the government. Then we have public uh, uh, shelters and another one in a nearby pl in a place nearby Valencia. After years and years without being able to do anything uh, on the civil war, being able to work on the shelter was a big uh, pleasure and to organize a specific exhibition was an incredible experience. The works in the shelter located in the town hall uh, started with a study of the walls. Then we did a uh, uh, following of the archaeological studies. And then we gave a value to the shelter by organizing a permanent and a temporary exhibition. Azcarra, the historian, uh, helped us organize the exhibition. and. The exhibition was there for a year. When we visited the shelter in the town hall for the first time, uh, the politics in the town hall had changed a few months before our visit. And uh, it was uh, the shelter was a kind of a storage room. Here we had people that had put uh, things uh, on the wall, someone, lots of papers uh, from uh, the previous mayor of uh, Valencia. And here we had pictures, pens, forgotten there in the shelter 30 years uh, before when um, and phones that looked like phones from the Second World War. We could access the documents that were stored there as well. And now they are in the Valencia archive. And 
we started to do tests on the wall to see what was left from the original shelter because the this space had been painted, the floor had been redone. So we did some tests on the walls and we could see that uh, it was painted. The original shelter was painted. We could find also air ducts and we could also see the original floor. The ori we thought that the original floor wouldn't be in a good condition, but it was. And we could find also material from that time, like a piece of newspaper and a couple of tram tickets that probably had the people who made the floor of the shelter. That was the first stage. Then we do uh, an archaeological follow-up. We were doing um, a study of this uh, shelter, and we could find the whole of the engine and the air channeling. In some cases, the engine was preserved. But uh, here, we couldn't find it. We found the toilet, the pipe that was there, and the benches and that, that were no longer there because they had taken them out to put uh, shelters. Then, with the original colors that we found in the shelter, we try to restore the place to its original state. Uh, here, the light, we never agreed on the lighting because people doing the uh, security plans and uh, lightning. Sometimes they think that they think this is a, a, a nightclub instead of a civil war shelter. But uh, sometimes uh, we have to make concessions. We found that the vaults had this uh, color. Uh, and we tried to go back to the origin of the shelter or get the shelter to its original state. This coincides with the renovation of part of the town hall that uh, was the access to the shelter. There were offices for civil servants, and it has been turned into an area that can be visited right now. And this is part of the exhibition that we organized. Some of the works uh, that we did can be seen here in the posters that Pepe has prepared, and others you can see here about the different types that Jordi Ramos uh, has mentioned. Here we have so the government shelters and the school shelters are another type. And that was a shelter uh, similar to the one we work in the town hall building. This is one of the last images here. We have a video with oral witness of people who experienced, who lived, uh, experienced the bombings. And some conclusions. It's clear that memory politics are uh, needed to carry out these works, and without political will, it's very difficult to carry out these kind of works because we need financing. And we have seen that we have suffered this situation of lack of political will in the Valencia region. And let's see what happens in May with the new elections. And 
we have to give value to the archaeologist and the work he or she does because it's an, in, it's very much needed when we talk about heritage and what has been mentioned emotions are also very important but we have also to work the scientific and historical aspects because otherwise we would be given a partial version of what happened. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Miguel. You introduced very important topics, such as, for example, this controversy of the dependence on the ruling party and some programs run out of funding, what is restored and how and how shelters, shelters coexist with current heritage. Tim Mais and Montserrat Pujes will talk now. They will tell us about what was done in Barcelona. And Miguel was telling us about the preservation policy, or the, the policy in this sense, and they will tell us about the legislation and how the shelters are protected. I don't know if they all need to be protected or not. And also, what is the policy, whether they are restored or not, and whether there is a clear legislation in this regard. So you have the floor. Hola, buena tarde. Um, Good afternoon. We are representatives of the Archaeology Service. We are employees of the Archaeology Service. This is a municipal body which depends on the Barcelona Town Council. And as she said, we will tell you a bit about our work vis-à-vis -vis shelters. But before that, let me give you a spoiler. There is one person in this room who should tell us about something. It is important that she does so, but she has to leave. So do remember what we're going to say now, what Gemma Armandez is going to say now. She is the territorial archaeologist of Barcelona, representative of the Catalan government in this matter. And it will be nice for her to give us make us to make this comment. Gemma, as we agreed. This morning we were sitting down next to one another and after hearing the opening speech I said to Montserrat that all shelters, at least in Barcelona, since we have spoken so well about the Barcelona case, I'm here not talking from the point of view of the Catalan government but as an archaeologist who has been working for 22 years, um, I think they should be protected as a cultural good of national interest, the top category in the legislation. And I'm referring here to the competencies of the Catalan organization. And I think that Local protection is very good, and the Valencia Initiative is, is very nice, but sometimes all of these actions of one group of the citizenship should be protected to the highest level allowed by the legislation. And we were talking to Montserrat and saying that it's difficult because to start with, we don't even know how many shelters we have or where they are. But it wouldn't be a first because, for example, in the case of a cave paintings, there is, for example, a, a generic declaration. For example, all areas with cave paintings are considered national interest heritage. And in our case, for example, in the case of the Mediterranean coast, we made them into world heritage. So it will be an interesting topic, too, because the law, we must take into account that the regional laws are within the framework of the historic heritage. 
at the level of Spain. So they are kind of constricted. And the regulation was passed by a general manager who was an archaeologist, Manolo Fernandez Miranda, and he was very careful. And this is why we have these archaeological zones, which was something unthinkable before, to lock things down. But we should also bear in mind that we were in the midst of the transition. So we were there was no concern with protecting these types of heritage, but also it would have been unthinkable to have these types of initiatives because they were trying to, to cover up this part of history, which was still too recent. So I do need to leave. I can stay for a few minutes. But my proposal is that I don't know if this should come from here this morning. Gisele and Domenic um, talked as well. And, well, we would like for these shelters to be considered under the, the, the top category that the law allows. It is a different topic that can be looked at from different perspective. It could be immaterial or material heritage. It could be both. We have built areas, which is what we call monuments still. Well, for me, it's very clear. I know what I would do. And from the administration, technically, it can be done. That's what I wanted to say. And I'm sorry I cannot stay to see whether this proposal is then carried into the debate. I will tell you about it. I don't know if I should wait or where our talk is coordinated with Chavin. He had to leave for a minute. But, well, from my ignorance, I'm not an archaeologist, but so what you're asking is for the protection of the entire network of shelters or some specific shelters, or how would that work? The entire, the entire network of shelters. You apologize, but she's not using the mic at the moment. Despite not knowing their scope, their amount, their status, because they may be in ruins. Okay, thank you. No, I don't know what to do. Shall we? Yeah, we shall start. Well, this talk was not in coordination with him, but we'll start. Otherwise, we won't have time for the debate later. So, Well, for those of you who do not know it, the Archaeology Service of Barcelona, I'll give you a brief overview of the service where we are. And as a goal, in the broader sense of the word, the archaeology service watches over the archaeological heritage of the city. The city understood as one single field, site, and these sessions, for example, here today are an example. The archaeological study provides data for the recovery of our recent history. And here, we're giving you a brief overview, a bit of an exercise on memory spaces of the civil war here in Barcelona that we have recovered ever since uh, the first shelter 307 reopened in, in Popla Sec. We could say that in the 90s, with the discovery of the Plaza del Diamant shelter, Revolution Square shelter, and the documentation and intervention in Shelter 307, this was like an awakening and the public was made aware of the existence and in some cases the opening of some of these shelters. In the year 2000, the archaeology service 
had a before and after because it was the first intervention in the Villa de Madrid Square shelter, an intervention with an archaeological methodology as a way of working with this heritage. And then Tavi, who is his back, uh, Tavi will give us more information about this concept. And in 2009, these were the first sessions, the ones before this one. This was 14 years ago. And time goes by so quickly, as we were saying. And now we are the, the heirs who have to continue with this task that has been placed on the table and that we now have to continue with. And back then, the archaeology service organized an internal session on the materials that we recuperate from the shelters, what to do with it, how to rehabilitate it, what criteria to follow. And in 2011, the anti-aircraft battery Arturo de la Rubira opened, and then between 2015 and 2017, there was a whole work of research and discovery of the holding cells in the Montjuic castle. In three out of five in the corridor, we found more than 650 graffiti, not all of them belonging to the period of the Civil War, but most of them do belong to that period. And let me say something thinking of Ana Sánchez, who this morning claimed the role of women in all this. And I wanted to mention at least Valerie Powells, who is no longer with us. And on March 8th, uh, a small square received her name, also to remember this leader of the neighborhood movement in Poblasek, to make the shelter known, and she was the and as Montserrat said, she was giving you an overview of the, our work in the past few years. And in the period between the year 2000 and 2023, the Archaeology Service has inventoried 93 shelters. There are many more, of course. And there have been archaeological interventions in 34 with preventative interventions, a, a team of archaeologists has worked on shelters. Some of them have been preserved, some others have not. Uh, there are very different cases. And out of these uh, shelters that can be visited in Barcelona at the moment, there are four. Uh, shelter 307, managed by the Museum of History, Plaza del Diamant, uh, in the neighborhood of Gracia, La Lira in San Andreu, which is a private shelter, uh, privately managed, and also Mas Guinardo the Horta Guinardo district, and shortly Torre de la Sagrera will open to the public and also Plaza de la Revolución in Gracia. And the archaeology service does not only focus on shelters, we also focus on other elements related to the Spanish Civil War, such as batteries, anti-aircraft batteries. We try to make inventories with the subsoil unit of the Catalan police. They have a poster here and we try to make an inventory of elements of the civil war. And in 2017, when a tree fell, it uncovered a hole. I went in with them, and we discovered the coastal battery in Jaume I, which was a battery from the civil war, built on two levels. It is completely whole, it was built completely, but it was never used, and it's an element of the Civil War. 
that never actually worked, but it's part of our heritage. And finally, with the Catalan police, we have a collaboration agreement since 2017 to be able to enter air raid shelters safely. But we've been working with them since 2013, if I'm not mistaken. In a summarized manner, the first bombing one, it was in 13, on the 13th of February 1937 by the Eugenio de Savoye ship, an Italian destructor. And then starting March 1937, we started um, suffering the bombings of the fascist uh, Italian fascist aviation with a lot of anxiety, 200 bombings, 2,700 dead, 7,000 injured, which led to a civil and republican effort to build shelters in the city of Barcelona. And in this sense, well, I'm getting ahead, but these 1,322 shelters that we've all been mentioning, this is a census, of course. We don't know whether they were all built. And in Barcelona, we have documented many public ones. There are also private ones. And in June 1937, the Passive Defense Board of Catalonia was created. Jordi already talked about this, so I will not get into detail. And as I said before, out of those 1,322, we have not located as many, much less. Every year we locate new ones uh, with these preventative archaeological interventions. And out of these 1,300, many are private. Anna did a lot of uh, work locating many private shelters. The problem is that they mistrust us. They mistrust public administration. They don't want to have anything to do with us because they think that if we go them to inventory them, to, to know them, they believe that we will make them do things that they don't want to do or we will take hold of the shelters. So sometimes I go there as an as assistant. I don't say that I don't come from the archaeology. I don't say that I come from the archaeology service because they may think I'm the devil and they don't want me in there. So I just go there as her assistant to take pictures of these shelters. There are private shelters in Sarria, Gracia districts that we have not been able to access yet, and our intention is to document them and include them in our inventory of shelters. But as you can see, there's a lot of work to be done in this sense. This is the map of the census of 1938 with these 1,322 all over Barcelona. And these I will mention very briefly because Jordi already explained it, and Miguel as well, in Barcelona, we see underground uh, stations, train stations used as shelters, and newly built. There were trenches in streets and squares, and then cellular shelters like the one under the Tetuan Square, which were built with concrete, and then the most regular type 85% of shelters in Barcelona are the ones of the mine gallery type, the shaft type. They're very, very solid. And these, well, the, the subsoil is very solid, so they could excavate in depth and make safe shelters in Barcelona's underground. And then in other areas, there were open air shelters with concrete that they were, were built out in the open and covered with concrete. And the shelters can also be public or private. Uh, there are some belonging to neighbor associations, most of those included in the 1938 census. Also, factory shelters, like the one from the Elizalde factory, F14, and another one that I visited in La Barneda Street in San Mati district, which was also built under a factory. Also domestic or private shelters, there are hundreds of those in Barcelona, belonging to the neighbors of the building, who did not want to be a part 
of the community civil effort of the population to create public shelters, and they made public shelters for themselves or for their association of neighbors. There are many like those, like the one in Mallorca Street. This one is spectacular, very well preserved, large to shelter the people of a very large building. And finally, institutional shelters, such as the one of the Catalan Parliament that Jordi photographed back in the day. And now we will talk about different examples of shelters and the work done. Yes, at the moment, we are working on some of them to open them up to the public. One is this in La Sagrera Tower in the neighborhood of San Andreu. We'll give you a brief overview. You can see here that this is a large shelter that was accessed via this house at the bottom. And at the moment, we are working basically on, struct on the structure. A survey has been conducted because opening up a space like this to the public means that we need to ensure that it's stable, especially for visitors. And we've encountered some surprises, meaning that Structure specialists have seen that the vibrations of the street may make the structure collapse. We are now placing pavement, a pavement that can work well with the entire structure of the floors and the ceilings to withhold the vibrations. It was a surprise. It was a, a shock because we thought, well, we will barely have to do anything. And in the end, we had to do a lot of work. These are some pictures of this shelter, which is quite, well, it is a um, mine shaft, quite elaborate. It is covered with, with concrete, and there were columns to hold the benches. We have not found the wooden benches. The wood is more difficult to preserve, and, and we have not found any trace of it. There were latrines as well. Here, a detail of the, the light fixtures and some remains that we found. And this is some of the previous work that we've done. We've preserved all of this because now there are quite many people working there. And we've made sure that no one will drop or break these fixtures and these elements. And I will give you more information about the other things we have found in a minute. This is one of the shelters that Xavi was telling you about, one of the institutional shelters. It was the shelter of the Catalan government. This does not mean that it is directly under the palace. It's, so to speak, outside. And it is all made of concrete. You can see the, the design. There are separation walls. Yes, if you allow me one second, there are different posters here of Barcelona. And here on this side, there is one poster about the Sagrada Tower shelter and the Catalan Parliament um, shelter. And yes, the, what we did was that the wiring for the lighting was on the floor and we've repositioned it, we've studied where it was, where it should have been, and we've repositioned it. We've found pieces of fabric that we have restored, and some shoes, personal effects, uh, jewels, not much, really. And same thing here, some graffiti, some pictures. This is one of those that I said were found under factories. It is very well preserved, I would say. 
for now no interventions are planned same perspective this is another type of shelter well this one it's just for you to see that there are many types of shelters in Barcelona in a different status. And this, for example, is Shelter 722, but this does not mean that all of them were built, because in this case, they encountered some loose uh, substrate, and they could not continue um, excavating, and they had to stop construction, so it was not built in the end. And now if we go into the study of materials, rehabilitation, I would like to tell you about uh, those sessions we organized in 2009 and, and so based on that in our ex current experience, we've already discussed that the shelters after the war were closed up and normally now when we go back in we find pockets of waste material or we could say rather than waste uh, building materials mixed with rubble and we assume that they were placed there just before walling them up and, and locking them up so when we try to interpret the materials that we find whether these materials were used in the shelter or not when we find this rubble we discard it because we consider it was just rubble that was placed there after the fact it seems like a very basic thing to say but until you've seen quite a few of them you do not realize this is the case there are plaques for example that we've tried to recuperate if you have the opportunity to go to the exhibition, we took this one out and it's, it has been restored. And it's difficult because it, these materials and linings are materials that were prepared very quickly and there are no layers that allow you to, to repair them. These are very delicate operations. Preserving, for example, a comb may sound silly to you, but I will tell you that it is not a silly thing. It is talking to us about a time where new materials were used. This is the first plastic recovered from an archaeological intervention, and you may not be able to see it, but it says Hamburg, New York, I think it's 1924. So it's important to stop and think before you discard materials. In this case, it, w it was easy, it was clear to all of us that we had to keep that. But in these cases, it was not so easy. All of these bottles, for example, some say, oh, these, uh, I can find them by the dozen in my grandparents' attic. But you need to be able to, to attach the necessary meaning to these objects, to think twice, and recuperating them means taking on preservation and maintenance, and this means a lot of money a lot of money that we don't always have. So, well, a reflection on the criteria and what will be preserved and what will be done with it is necessary because we need to be responsible. This is a part of the things that we find. This is another part of the things that we find. This is something that we found on the internet. And this is for sale. And it may be very interesting to, to obtain because this is something that we will not find in a shelter. It is an armband with the name of the person it belonged to. Yes, the area of heritage of Barcelona. Well, this is, um, for example, the battery that we found in Montjuic. The Catalan police, I mentioned them before, we have been working with them since 2013. There is a poster here in, and you can ask them any questions you have. Without them, we would not be able to access many of the shelters. 
different risks, uh, falls, lack of oxygen, pollutants, uh, collapsing ceilings, it's dangerous. And finally, dissemination, inventory, dissemination of the heritage of the civil war, specifically shelters. This is our website of shelters. I encourage you to, to visit it. It contains a lot of information, and we continue to add new information every day. There is a lot to do, and it's always difficult to, to have enough time to add all of the new information, but we do everything we can to update it on a daily basis. And finally, the novelty is that now we can show these shelters because 90% of the cases people cannot access them because of the poor state, risk of falls, collapsing. So what we've done is based on the archaeological interventions, we've been documented all shelters with a laser scanner whenever it's feasible, whenever they are in a good status when they are not collapsed. So when they are in the, the optimal conditions, they are laser scanned, and then a 3D model is created that we incorporated very recently onto our website. It takes a bit long to load. This is the Valencia Street Shelter that we excavated. Emiliano Hinojo is the archaeologist who documented it. And this is the latest 3D model that we have of a Barcelona shelter. It is heavy, it takes a long time to load, especially on Wi-Fi. But just for you to see what we want to do with all air raid uh, shelters uh, in Barcelona at the archaeology department. We always want to give context of the urban environment for people to understand the shelter. The shelter without its urban context is, is useless. It does not give you an image of, of volume, of context. And so very briefly, well, not this one. Here we can access it. We show a picture that can be enlarged so that you can see the picture taken from the same perspective. You can navigate here. It's better to do it with a mouse. I don't want to get into it now. But while you can move around easily, you can see different areas of the shelter, different gallery accesses, a latrine. There were many found in, in Barcelona in different shelters quite common, a second level of uh, a shelter with different levels in Barcelona, another access. And this is the future of the archaeology service. We want to document the different shelters and disseminate them, because otherwise they will remain in our hard drives and no one will get to know them. Thank you all very much. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, one more thing. We're not done. We're not done. Well, no, we're not done because this is one way of showing shelters virtually, but there's still demand among citizens that we open shelters to the public with public visits. And the one at La Sagrera that I mentioned and the one at the Revolution Square in Gracia if everything goes well, they will be open to the public this summer. Visits will be organized. And we were excited to tell you that for us, opening up these, these shelters is, and I think this is what perspired of this morning's session is like making it possible for people to feel the past, not just seeing it, but feeling it. For us, it's important not to change many things in the shelters, just trying to preserve this, this atmosphere of austerity, loneliness, and maybe despair even. Even if you just close your eyes for a second. So this visit that we will be opening of these two shelters, the, the proposal was 
that the museum elements are found outside before you access the shelter and you experience the experience. And something that happened inadvertently was that when we were trying to see how to turn the shelter of Plaza de la Revolución into a museum, it is a very large shelter, but only the infirmary was preserved. And we thought, well, it's ideal because it, it was a necessary space in shelters. It was recommended to, to have it for the care of those taking shelter there and for people to have this place to receive treatment. And we also know that it was a time in which medicine advanced very quickly. In lips and pounds, I think you all know Dr. Trueta and his methods during the Second World War with the treatment of injuries and other things. So we thought, well, it would be ideal in this shelter not to talk about the war, because we talk about the war in Shelter 307, and it seems like it's like we, what we resort to. We always talk about the war, but there's not that much to talk about. So we thought, okay, here we will try to talk about care, health care, everything it involved back then and what was done inside the shelters. And this led us to saying, well, it would be ideal that if we open up shelters, maybe not, I don't know, 25, but maybe one per district, if we open them to the public, maybe we can complement different aspects revolving around the civil war, and all of them together, this entire network or route or whatever you want to call it, together with Munjuic, Tura de la Rubira, and all these other spaces that we already have, can give you an idea of the civil war and what it represented and what it was for Barcelona. And this is where this idea stems from. We said, let's not create a museum of the civil war. Let's establish that our shelters will be devoted to monographic areas and all of them together will make up a museum that you can go through, going through the entire city. And let me close by saying that this links with the very first session that was organized and th this plan was already written back then. And I found a piece of news published about those sessions and the editor back then, Ramon Arnavat, I don't know if he's here now, he was here this morning, and he said the book is the product of two sessions to decide what to do with shelters in Barcelona. And he says what differentiates this publication is the differentiation of what is being, or the comparison of what is being done in Barcelona and Catalonia with what is being done. Hold on. I apologize. I think it is worth it to, to read it. With what is being done in other European countries to draw conclusions in order to try and have a network of shelters that can be visited that will allow the new generations to really understand what the civil war was like. So I'm not saying anything new. I'm rereading things and we only try to find a way to do, to make it true. And so let's see if the Democratic Memorial, the Archaeologist Service and everyone involved, let's see if amongst all of us we can organize a panel, a task force to work along those lines if you agree. And we'll stop here. Thank you very much.
We've heard several announcements, uh, such as have a network of uh, shelters that can be visited. I don't know if, uh, besides the two, you have announced there are others. Gabrielle was mentioning at the beginning the importance of including the emotional part, the experience lived. Also, Mikel mentioned the scientific knowledge to include that, and uh, we've seen examples of different shelters. And before opening the Q&A session, I would like, if we talk about this possible m musealization, you were saying of um, not doing a lot, and but we have a generation um, that uh, didn't experience that period, and uh, uh, grandparents who lived this period uh, are dying. So how can we convey all the events that happen to this younger generation that won't be able to uh, listen the stories from their uh, grandparents, how to convey this experience and the horror uh, lived. All the objects that you have found, how are you going to ex exhibit them? How do we make these objects known to the larger audience? I don't know if one of our speakers wants to answer the questions. I don't know. The new generations, for me, have so much information and images, and we have so many films as well. So I would tell them, visit this space, close your eyes, and uh, think about everything you've seen and you know, and that should be enough. Um, Gabriel Moshenska was uh, mentioning the folklore around uh, shelters, so I don't like to put problems and uh, objects in the shelters. I am because uh, I've seen this and um, I don't like it and I think that entering the shelter is very emotional. I don't know if um, we should add uh, the, the testimony of people who experience that when we go into a museum, into a shelter, sorry, if we should include the witness, the testimony. I think there are, um, for any uh, work of this kind, you need a proper a, a communication strategy to, to to identify different audiences, young people, students, families, and to and to evaluate what is the most effective means of communicating with, with each of, of these audiences. Work with teachers. Work with schools. I think. Um, I think we are maybe underestimating young people's ability here to use imagination, to be ex excited about these ideas of spaces beneath their feet. I think there is in enough interest there. We, we, we don't need to fill them with interactive digital toys. I think we can do this. As I mentioned as well, the, the, this is connected with the contemporary world. Young people are aware there are wars occurring today, wars that are impacting on people their age, that they can understand this, they can empathize, and this is, these are tools that we, we, we can use for in interpreting this heritage. Sudan. <laughs> The problem here is that the kind of shelters we have in Barcelona or Valencia or in the UK or in Berlin are very different. Here in Barcelona we have uh, mind galleries, 30% or 20% are in a bad uh, condition. So accessing these shelters is very complicated. It's not possible for security reasons and because it's too risky. So the technological means are useful for that. 
to use them in spaces where we can only uh, access with the police, uh, us, and the rest, but the rest of the population cannot visit these places. So we have to strike a balance between the shelters that we can visit that um, will not be many, and the rest must be accessible by digital means. It's a different way of visiting this uh, heritage. I think someone had a question. My name is uh, Jose Maria Contero. I think that uh, the panel has been a very good one because we have heard different perspectives. Jordi Ramos was uh, telling us about Madrid. It's true. And this morning we were talking about bombings. And we think about aircraft, but bombings have been existed for 300 years because we can bomb in many different ways. And uh, Madrid was, was bombed uh, by cannons, and uh, nothing was flying, so there were no sirens going off. And we've seen that in uh, the Ukraine, too. So uh, Madrid uh, was... Uh, generated a special kind of uh, shelters. In Valencia also, there were different shelters. I know them. I don't know uh, London, uh, Barcelona. And so um, it was very interesting. I like Montserrat uh, saying that uh, uh, not everything that we find in uh, shelters is rubble. Uh, no, well, shelters had to be very clean because the uh, Passive Defense Board um, said that the shelters had to be clean, but when they were closed, many people went in and started making fire, uh, throwing things in there, and uh, among the garbage, uh, that we can find are pieces that can be interesting. And I think Montserrat explained that very well. And uh, it was mentioned uh, uh, Valerie Powell, the British citizen, that I think that uh, the town council, the officials at the city council didn't treat her well. And I'm happy that now there is a square with her name. Uh, I met her. It was a woman and that the administration thought that she was a nuisance. Uh, she, they, she, the administration, the authorities, local authorities uh, didn't listen to her, and uh, but she did a very important work, so thank you for mentioning her. And there is a conflict, because you said that for the shelter in the Amano Square was found in uh, 92, no, it was, I don't think that uh, the date, I think we should agree on the date where this shelter was found, because I thought it was 99. Other questions? Hola, Many things. An observation, it has been mentioned uh, about folklore. And this dichotomy between uh, emotions and science, I think that is part of uh, the archaeology. I think that the study of emotions are part of the narratives, and archaeology is something that takes into account. And I think that establishing this dichotomy between uh, emotions and science doesn't help. I focus on how subsoil and shelters have reproduced uh, tensions that we could be in the surface. Uh, the, the shelters were also a battleground. There were different projects, proposals, different ways of constructing, uh, different conflicts that took place. 
Eh, y en aquel sentido, me en... interesaría eso. Bueno, pues sería un apunte sobre esta cosa de la impresión. I would like to mention that, that it's not possible to preserve all shelters. Maybe we should uh, preserve the ones that have better uh, structural conditions. I think 3D projects are very good, but the personal experience cannot be compared to the virtual experience. And I think that there are uh, technical means and budget, probably, because uh, this soft 3D software probably spends, uh, costs a lot of money. But I think that uh, maybe 50 square meters or 100 square meters could be preserved. We have engineers here that could uh, achieve this, that to make these spaces safe. Eh, sobre bueno como una reflexión no para qué también por para qué why this uh, body experience is important maybe and as it has been said this shelter several uh, activities can be carried out in these shelters but these shelters could become also climate shelters and now we talk about libraries uh, for instance where there is air conditioning during the summer maybe these shelters could be also climate uh, shelters or future war uh, shelters for future wars that and sadly might occur. I think there was a question or a remark. I don't know if you want to answer this, if we could give another use uh, for a shelters as a climate shelters, for instance, or libraries. As I was saying in Barcelona, we have few shelters that have optimal conditions to be open to the public. In many uh, have parts which collapse, and it would uh, cost a lot, a lot of money to um, repair these places to be ac make them accessible to the public. Uh, these confined spaces, um, it's very complicated, and it requires lots of money. Climate shelters to work as a library or a climate well the shelters in Barcelona are so narrow it difficult. The examples in Berlin or London that are larger um, shelters maybe that, that could be different. But uh, here, except a couple uh, of shelters, the others are one meter wide. So that would be difficult to turn them into climate shelters. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I respond on the point of embodied experience, the experience of physically being in the shelter compared to experiencing it virtually. Um, I think this is incredibly powerful, the feeling of being deep underground, the temperature, humidity, the acoustics. These, this is a very, very distinctive experience. I have, uh, as part of my work, uh, I do oral history interviews with people who, have, who, have, who were using the air age shelters I'm excavating. In some cases, I've been able to conduct interviews within those sh shelters. These are completely different interviews. The a smell even of, of the being underground sparks different memories, more intense memories. It's incredibly powerful. I think for those people who are interested in visiting sh shelters, and let's be honest, we're all interested. The public may be 5% are interested. Of those, 99 out of 100, they, they want to visit one shelter, th that's enough. But it's imp important then that this is a, this is a um, bodied, proper experience. For the, for the rest of us, we can play with digital models as well. These are wonderful, but they are not for the, the, the public, I think. Uh, 
Maybe we could find a middle way between the body experience and a virtual experience, the middle work would be the um, bridge creek of the Imperial War Museum. And I've done the experience in a shelter here in Barcelona and a shelter at the Imperial War Museum, and it's fantastic, the experience there, because children can experience that. They don't have the experience of um, complete reality, but for children it's very good to be able to uh, listen to the sounds of a real uh, attack. The problem here, and I know it's very complicated, but uh, have 100% security when we go in with children, it's complicated. But maybe we could make an effort um, to allow these children to go into the shelters, for them to understand that their grandparents were there. Uh, your colleague from the Department of Archaeology has left. But for us, that uh, we have been fighting for a chapel, and this is not related, but that uh, these shelters are declared uh, a, 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 an asset of national interest, that would be very interesting. Thank you. More questions? If you want our panelists want to add something, make a remark. If I can be a bit uh, provocative, how many shelters do we need here? But right now, I mean, there are already shelter m museums. Are they unable to deal with the number of visitors? Do we need to open more to deal with the huge demand for visitors? I don't think so. Will we have enough, perhaps? The rest, study them, record them carefully, digitally, leave them alone. We have enough. What are we trying to create with this? I employment for, our, for ourselves, that's fine, but you know, maybe this is enough. Just, yeah. <laughs>